In this episode of Mind Pump, of course we talk about fitness, health, fat loss, muscle building, but we also do some current events and we talk about ourselves quite a bit. Yeah. The first 42 minutes was the introductory portion of this episode. I opened up by talking about a controlled study on red light therapy on skin. More studies are showing that red light therapy reduces the appearance of fine lines, wrinkles, and increases collagen production in the skin. It actually works. Now, one of our partners are the makers of the best red light therapy you can get for your home. It's Juve, J-O-O-V-V dot com forward slash mind pump. And if you go on there and use that link, you'll get a free MAPS Prime program with the purchase of $500 or more, and we'll hook you up with free shipping. Then we talked about the show Diagnosis on Netflix. This show is compelling. You got to check it out. Yeah, I'm glad you got uh, into it. Adam talked all about his weekend uh, at his high school. He does a 20-year reunion. Woo! Woo, a lot of pissed off girls. <laughs> Such a heartbreaker. Then he talked about the how he was annoying people at the bar with touch tunes. I guess he could change the music in the bar. Justin gave us another rat update. Uh, his cat, it's real, you guys. His cat is lazy. Uh, I talked about my ultrasound. That's right. I got the results of my ultrasound, so we do the gender reveal. You're having a baby. <laughs> no. no, no, no. That's not how it works. Oh. Uh, I talked about a study on cannabinoids and retrograde signaling. Now, cannabinoids have uh, seem to have these far-reaching effects in the whole body. That's what the anecdotes uh, keep saying. People are talking about pain, anxiety. Uh, digestive issues, like how can that be possible? So I explained a little bit of how cannabinoids work and why if you do use cannabinoids, you probably want to utilize a full spectrum of them. Now our partners, Ned, makes full spectrum cannabinoid uh, oil from hemp. So it's totally legal and it's got all the cannabinoids except for THC. There's a tiny, tiny bit of THC, but it's perfectly legal. Most of it is CBD and the other cannabinoids. Um, if you go to helloned.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get 15% off your first purchase. And then we talked about how Mexico is trying to decriminalize all drugs and convince America to do the same. Kind of crazy. I like your style, Mexico. Then we got to the fitness uh, question portion of this episode. The first question, what is the relationship between strength and endurance? How are they related? In other words, if you improve your endurance, do you get stronger or does strength go down and vice versa? Next question, what are some exercises for working the serratus muscle? Now, serratus muscle kind of looks like abs that run along the side of your body but up near your armpit. If you're lean, you can see them. They help stabilize your shoulder blade, so we talk about exercises for that muscle. The next question, is drinking naturally flavored seltzer water, the calorie-free ones, is that better or worse than just drinking a diet soda? And the final question, is it important to have hobbies – that are not fitness or health related. Also, this month, MAPS Starter, our fitness program that was designed for people getting started in a resistance training program. So if you're listening right now and you're thinking about starting lifting weights, you want to reap the benefits of weights, you want to build muscle, burn body fat, you want to speed up your metabolism, but you haven't worked out with weights before or it's been a long time, MAPS Starter is the program to get started with. That's where you want to get going. And it utilizes dumbbells and physio balls, and that's it. So you could do the whole workout at home with very, very minimal equipment. It's also suitable for trainers to, get, to use on beginner clients, and it's a great gift. If you have a parent or you have a child that's getting started with the resistance training or a friend who all they do is cardio and you want them to start lifting some weight so they can strengthen their body and speed up their metabolism, that's MAP Starter. Well, that program is half off. It's 50% off. Here's what you do. Go to mapsstarter.com, that's M-A-P-S-S-T-A-R-T-E-R.com, and use the code STARTER50. That's S-T-A-R-T-E-R-5-0, no space, for the discount. Because you're never dark enough when you're on stage. Yeah, no, totally. No. You ever, I remember the first time I saw my buddy. <laughs> you didn't who didn't tan enough? No, my buddy is, uh, I mean, he's a white dude, but he got, you know, did the paint on tan and stuff beforehand. Yeah. And I saw him and I was like, I was like, bro. Like, who are you? Yeah. I was like, you went too far. That's yeah. way too dark. He's like, he's like the color of like the walls here. How's that even happen? I, I just turned straight orange. Yeah. Well, no, dude. And then when you went on stage, it wasn't dark enough. No, it wasn't. So I did wow. this. So my very first client, okay. The very first client that I ever had to coach, I actually, for a bikini competition, first one I ever did, this was forever ago. 
And you know, I'm, I don't, I've never coached a client and on a show before. I'm learning all of this way before I ever got into any of this. So like, I'm learning with her through the whole process, and we get to the, like the tanning thing and everything. I'm reading is like, you know, oh, you want to make sure you do at least two to three coats. And so I had her go to the tanning salon, do you know, two to three coats before, and we get there, and I'm looking. I'm like, man, she's so dark. Mm-hmm. Like this, she gets on the stage, bro, and she looked ghost white. Yeah. Oh my god, I was like, what? I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh fuck, I sent my client up there, and she doesn't even look like she has a tan. <laughs> no, the lights, no. dude. The way the, those lights are set up, they just wash you out. Yeah. Like hard. Remember what Adam looked like when we went to that one oh, show? Yeah. No, I know. I just, it's just weird to me that like you really have to get that dark it's like, because you go up there and you're just the, sh- the lights are shining right on you yeah and it makes you look whiter way whiter way way it, i mean you, that's why it looks so ridiculous when you see them off the stage i know you yeah, know you think was, to yourself like i mean they paint it on <laughs> yeah they actually paint like coats of it's, it's almost like offensive to me you know, yeah it's too much these people that's it's offensive it's that, too much <laughs> that orange paint all over their body it's ridiculous like, what are you doing <laughs> oh so uh i wanted to uh, Talking about skin and stuff, I wanted to talk about a study that was done on. Is this um, the one I sent you? Yeah, this is the one that you sent me that you wanted me to read, Adam. Do you remember the title of it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, of course not, bro. As soon as I get them, I send them right over to you. Yeah. Someone, uh, someone sends me yeah, information. Dude, this like, one's sciencey. Yeah, I, I go, like this. I, I assume I check how long I have to read. You go fifteen minutes. Uh, fuck this. Fuck send it over. Send it over, <laughs> Sal. Yo, Sal, check this out. Make sure this is cool. Dude, we can give talk me about the cliff notes. It. No, this is a good one. It was the 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 study was talking about how red light treatments uh, affect the reduction of fine lines, wrinkles, skin roughness, and intradermal collagen density. So, the actual collagen production underneath or inside the skin, and they found that it works very well. This is another study that shows mm. that it works very well. So it says that they well, isn't this originally? You know, red light therapy was popular first in like the you know dermatology and stuff like that. And when you go like to some like salons, like the nail salons and places like that, they had these little red lights. That's the first time I'd ever seen them. Was like a decade ago. Yes, because yeah. because they weren't really commercial. They were available, but but they were super super expensive. And the ones that you got back then that you could get for your house were just cheap knockoffs. And that's the thing, like when we first partnered with Juve, they were very uh, careful to explain that to us, like, no, 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 like you have to have the right quality. Otherwise, it's just a red light shining on your skin and it's not going to do nearly uh, what it's supposed to do. So what this study says is that A, it definitely demonstrated uh, uh, efficacy. I don't know why I couldn't pronounce that for a second. So it definitely worked. People who used it noticed a reduction in wrinkles and fine lines, which is crazy because my whole life I always thought there was nothing you could do about that, but apparently yeah. this actually works. And then the second thing that they said was that it did increase collagen uh, production compared to controls. So trip off that. Like wow. if you get the deep penetrating red light to some joints that may be surface joints, like joints that are super deep in the body, maybe like elbows, knees, fingers, that kind of stuff, um, improving collagen, collagen production theoretically could improve the or, or speed pain. up the healing yeah, yeah. process. And I know physical therapists use wow. red light for that process. Now, right? I, it's interesting I, for I have some theories on this, and I'm curious to what you think. Like, I think part of the reason, well, one of the reasons why I even think we partnered with them is this. Do you think that why we're seeing so much come out about red light therapy today in comparison to 10, 20 years ago or whatever is it? Do you think it is because the lack of sun that most people are starting to get? Because we're so indoors, a lot of these computer type jobs, and we're doing so many things under this artificial light. And yeah, in- no. So you do get some of the spectrum from the sun, but when you shine uh, a red light, you know one that's made specifically for this, you're getting a level uh, and a concentration that you wouldn't normally get um, from the sun. Oh, not even from the sun. No, and, oh, and I didn't know that. No, it's like hacking a system. Now, now the studies have been around for a long time. This actually has been studied for. You can find studies that are five decades old, four decades old on uh, photobiomodulation and red light therapy. Um, so it's been around for a long time. And what it does is it gets the, the, the cells of your skin and the deeper layers to produce more uh, energy, produce more ATP. So theoretically, you could probably use it too much and tire your cells out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if I, I don't think it's a good idea to like be under red light all the time. I definitely don't think that's a good idea. Mm-hmm. But I think like semi regular use, three four days a week, is ideal. It's going to give you that. It's going to stimulate that energy production. Um, but it is one of those things that if you stop using it, then the benefits are gone. Well, it's also you know what I mean. You have to keep using it. Yeah, like learning all this about the collagen, like. Uh, 
in terms of it being more of a beauty like product and, and people like really like taking that in more to address because you see all these crazy products that are coming out now to address wrinkles and like it, everything with Botox, but also I've, I've seen ones that have like facial massagers and all these kinds of different things to try and address like the, the, the anti-aging yeah. sort of, uh, you, you know, like everybody's on the hustle to create something for that. Yeah, no, the, 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 the most effective things you can do for your skin. And this is a, it's just so silly. I have to say this because it sounds so basic and simple but it makes a huge difference. And if you're listening right now, test it out on yourself. Be well hydrated. That's, a, that's the best thing you could possibly do for your skin. I can't tell you how many times I've had clients where I just have them drink more water and it like night and day. Happens to uh, my girlfriend, Jessica, all the time. She has a tendency to forget to drink and then I'll remind her and I can literally see her skin change yeah. by the hour. You could see it start to, because it's becoming hydrated. So that's number one. Number two, get better sleep. Your, well, that's the same with joint pain too. Yeah. I found. Yep. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Staying hydrated has done wonders for me. Absolutely. So get you know get good sleep, get good uh, hydration, good diet, um, be healthy, all that kind of stuff. But then if you want to do something in addition to that, um, <laughs> red light therapy is the most backed by study. There's nothing else that's more backed. Um, than that when it comes to reducing fine lines and wrinkles. It blew my mind that, I, I mean, I've been going to the dermatologist for, I don't know how many years now, probably eight years or so, and the never discussed diet, never discussed hydration, never discussed vitamin D, never discussed the red light therapy, none of those things. And all those things are the things that I think made the greatest impact on my psoriasis. When I look at like, because they, they promote the, the steroid creams like crazy, like that's their their result and they work you know what I'm saying you put a cream on there like it definitely will uh reduce Bro, it Bro, it's because they're looking at things through a particular filter and a lens and their filter i mean when you're a hammer everything looks like a nail right we've heard that before and they're trained uh quite extensively on what kind of me me medical interventions they they can prescribe you to help you with your problem so if you go in there and you have a skin issue they they don't really have a whole lot of training on nutrition. They don't have a whole lot of training on lifestyle. Um, they're privy to it, but not a whole lot. They know what medications will work best for you. Yeah, and that's just the filter that they see through. And it's crazy. I was watching that um, that show that series on Netflix, Diagnosis. Yeah, which oh, you, you watch it? Yeah, yeah I watched a couple. Like have you it? seen it? No. I love it. I love that show. Oh, so I play this game, right? We'll turn it on, and then within the first fifteen minutes, I guess yeah. what I think they have. You want to know what's crazy? I'm like. Fucking 100% right now. 100%? I'm 100% right now. Yeah, now, right. I don't know what you the- You called Gulf War Syndrome? So No, 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 no. What I mean is I'm 100% with oh. guessing uh, uh, with what the top doctors will guess. But no, oh, I'm not a- Yeah, I'm, it's a guess, right? Yeah, but I, you, you know what was interesting? One of the symptoms, too, and I was trying to describe, I'm like, that sounds a lot like rhabdo- Myosis. Oh, with you the know, late the, the girl, the girl that had so all that the contractions. one. I, that one I actually get. I actually guessed on the dot as I saw it. I guessed and I thought, oh, she has a metabolic disorder. Her muscles yeah. are breaking down. Right. And I and, and then they wasting. And I said, no, it's it's not the the glucose one. It's got to be the fatty acid one because she can still walk. And then it kicks in. But anyway, yeah. But anyway, I'm watching that one. The guy with the Gulf Four syndrome. Uh -huh. So this guy's got these crazy symptoms that seem mysterious. For ten years, doctors are trying to figure it out. But it's because they're looking at it through a particular lens. Yeah. They're not looking at it through the fact. Oh, you went to Gulf Four, and one third of everybody that went to Gulf Four has has these series of symptoms. Yeah. One third. Yeah, yeah, it was just an incredible statistic. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so so when they look at things through that lens, it's 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 tough. Like if somebody comes to me and says, hey, my back hurts, the lens that I look through it is, is movement, exercise, mobility, do you have good recruitment patterns? Right. I cannot diagnose uh, a slip disc or a fracture, aside from the fact that, oh, you're really painful, you probably might have something wrong. Yeah. That's not my expertise, you know what I'm saying? So same well, thing. that's, uh, I mean, and you watch it with Jessica, because uh, like when I watch it with Courtney, it's cool because she has the medical background, and so yeah. she's thinking already of like how, you know, they would treat or like test for certain conditions that I wouldn't have thought of versus, you know, I look at it more from, uh, you know, musculoskeletal kind of perspective and yeah. then also like, you know, the nervous system and, you know, nutrition and so. Much more holistic. Yeah, more holistic so it's it's kind of fun that way because you are kind of like trying to guess with all the rest of uh you know the doctors and the different all right i'm uh, sold i watch it yeah, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. on netflix yeah it's very emotional though. it is though yeah, yeah. it does tear really? at you well oh, because man. you see these people with these terrible the, the the second one i skipped with the kid i can't, came, I can't watch that yeah I'm no those that. ones oh yeah no, those i can't i can't up, watch dude. a little kid yeah. be sick and no one can help him it just right. fucks me up too much but 
it's hard because you're watching this and these poor people who are have whatever ailment they have. Like the first episode was about this young this young girl who all of a sudden started developing this severe muscle pain. Just severe. It kicked in. She couldn't fucking move. And then right afterwards, her urine would turn like Coca-Cola color. Right. Her, her CK levels would go through the roof. So obviously, her muscles are breaking down. And they can't figure out what the fuck's going on. And it's tough to watch because you got this young girl. She's got all this promise. And no one can figure out what the hell's going on. She can't figure out what the, you know. And then, then they, they come up with a solution. It's, it's, it's pretty good. But anyway, very, very compelling uh, compelling ser- uh, series. Anyway, I want to know about you guys this weekend. What did you guys do this weekend? 20 yeah. year, bro. Oh, you had oh, your 20 year? Yeah, yours is much more exciting than mine. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> that's right. I did. I did. You had a 20 year reunion. Yeah, well, you know. What was that like? Let's see. You know, I could talk a whole episode on this thing, so I'll probably just share that. You want to hear the real crazy stuff too, like the fucking. When you got there, dude, like I want to, I want to know, like, <clears throat> like what you saw, like right away. So, I'll tell you this. So I, I was telling Rachel this this morning that I was very, very impressed uh, with our girls in our class. So, uh, and I listed all their names off. That, and this is all part of like our tighter clique. There was probably. 25 or so from like my real tight niche clique of people uh, that were there, maybe 20, maybe 30 uh, that were there. And uh, there was seven of the girls that were like the ones we were like, I dated three of them. My best friend dated one. Like we all were really, really close. All of these girls are married and have at least two to four kids. And they looked amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah. They looked better than they looked in high school, man. Like okay. I was like oh, wow. for 20 years later. And I was, that's not what I thought I was going to walk into. I thought yeah, for that's sure. That's not typical. No. The guys look like shit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All the guys look like shit. There was like, there was, there was not a, actually not a single guy who I could say looked better today than he looked, you know, 20 years ago. Mm. The, the women actually did looked really good. And then, of course, there was always their succession in the world. There was a few girls that I remember being just. Uh, absolutely amazing. Everybody was chasing them in high school, and they just definitely didn't look that way twenty years later. But the gr- the core group that I hung out with was uh, no, they were amazing. I was so surprised that the guys, uh, quite a few of them, mess. Another thing though that I thought was amazing <clears throat> was a lot of people. I come from a very small town, so uh, you know it's kind of common. Part of why I wanted to get out and why I live in the Bay Area and the city was, you know, it's kind of common that some people get stuck in that small town you know you end up working at the local mechanic shop or and you just you kind of get and then you have your kids there and they go to the school there and i was not interested in that and to somebody who likes that like to each their own you know what i'm saying if that's what you desire to do like i wanted to get out and do more and be more and everything so you know i kind of thought i'd come back and there'd be a lot of that like a lot of like small town feel and working at the local gas station or whatever like that but Man, a lot of these guys that you know were out of high school that you didn't think were doing much with their life, they got into some basic construction or roofing or concrete or landscaping type of job. You know, twenty years later, they had taken all that time and they had built something themselves and were very successful entrepreneurs. Oh, phenomenal! Mm-hmm. So a lot of very successful guys that uh, that were I wouldn't have guessed to be that successful when I first graduated and kind of were hearing about what everybody was doing mm-hmm. as we left and went on our way. So that was really crazy. Um, we've had we've had two people die in our class. Oh wow! Yeah, um, driving well, accidents. No, no. One was a one was a, a actually both were drug overdose type things. Oh, that's mm-hmm. terrible. Yeah, and then one of the girls, I was like at the, our table. This is a kind of crazy story that I wasn't sure I was going to share it up, but fuck it. Uh, I was at the table, and, and I'm like, hey, where's where's Nikki at? And and someone's like, what? You didn't hear? Where, she's in prison. I'm like, prison? Yeah, no, she's not doing jail time. She's in prison. Wow. Yeah, and she's in, and this is like this little petite cheerleader girl, okay? <laughs> and I'm like, prison? What the fuck is she doing in prison? And she, uh, so check this out. You know, uh, what's that called where the, uh, the, is it SIDS? SIDS where the baby... Oh, uh, right, right, so, right. Sudden infant death syndrome. Yeah, right. So that's originally what it, it what got kind no, of you're gonna kill. you're going to piss me off uh, right now. Yeah, so she no. she uh, fell asleep, rolled over on the baby, oh. and it gets worse uh, when they and why she's in prison is because when they tested the, the baby's bloodstream, it had methamphetamines in it. Uh. So she had been doing meth and was breastfeeding her kid and- And then passed out or whatever. Passed out and rolled over and suffered. Wow. Right? I was wow. just- that's, that's dark. Hella wow, dark. That's terrible. Man. Right? Crazy. That's that was terrible. That was crazy. Um, what else happened at that event? 
you know, there was, there's, there's, I didn't bring Katrina. Uh, I bought her a ticket. Um, even though she didn't know I bought her a ticket, I bought her a ticket in case like she was like, how come I don't get to come? Or she yeah. wanted to come. And then I would be like, you can come. I got you a ticket. Like that was the, but I really didn't want her to come. And I didn't want her to come because, you know, a lot of this, I've, I don't, the, there's a core group of people, probably about five or so that I'm, I went to high school with that I still am really close to. And I still talk to them on a regular basis. And that was who I wanted to see more than anybody else. And then everybody else I was curious about mm -hmm. seeing, but then you never know, dude, like who is evolved from being the drama high school and sure shit. There's always that one or two that they're exactly the same as they fucking were. Uh, they would have been just been a pair pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, and especially when I know that they're part of our group, you know, so they're gonna be around. So like, yeah. Adam. Oh yeah, and drunk, oh. and I mean, spilling all over people, and and just being obnoxious, and I just didn't even want to subject Katrina to some the potential of that. Mm -hmm. And it's weird, at, like, like maybe, and I'm, I'm apologizing to any ex girlfriends that potentially listen to this show. I'm probably um, I was probably more of an asshole all back the then, ladies. where I would put. <laughs> <laughs> All you girls Fuck you, out Justin. There. You know that I probably would put them in that situation. I would probably thousands. put them in that situation. This is this is what how I would do shit. This is a you know sharing what an asshole I probably was. I would probably put them in this situation as like a test. Like oh, if you're a cool chick, you'll figure this out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what I would do in the past. I'm totally different with Katrina. Katrina, I'm very protective. Because she's her. won you over. Uh, yeah, it's already done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's like the old me would have like, yeah, let's bring the new chick. Let's uh, see how uh, she handles this situation. Uh, you know, uh, she's bad. She's gonna be able to handle this. Where it's funny, Katrina probably would have handled herself just fine. She would have been fine. But I'm so protective that I wouldn't even want her to have a bad night or go through any of that potentially. Yeah. That I'm like, nah, it's cool. You should stay home. Wow, crazy. So, yeah, well, good for you. I don't go to mine. I don't <clears> care. <throat> you know. So so what? I mean, what? Were you guys just like had music and everybody's dancing, like just chatting? Like what was the format? Yeah, so they they held it at the uh, country club. Was so, it like nineties music playing? Or yeah, yeah, they totally played. They had a live band. CNC Music Factory. They had a yeah. They have a live <laughs> band who played all the cover songs from shit that was during oh, our that's era. Cool. Yeah, so that was kind of that was always kind of playing in the back. Although I never really paid attention to the music. You were constantly mingling and talking yeah, to people, right? But you know, it's funny. It it like real quick, and I was telling. So I met up with a couple of my really tight friends before. Uh, that I wanted to have lunch with and hang out before. And I was like, you know what I'm I'm most worried about going is running into people that I should know and mm -hmm. like just a blank, like not knowing your name. Because mm -hmm. I, I like I try to think of like people in my class that I have like kind of memories of, but I'm like, I don't remember their name or any of this shit like that. So I was kind of worried about that, but it tripped me out. As soon as I got there, and I may probably because of this, like so we used to have a, a courtyard that was massive where most all during breaks and stuff, everybody hung out. And in that courtyard, everybody migrates to their cliques. Mm -hmm. You know, there's your, and you, and they, the fucking layout was like the same. No way. Yeah. Not like <laughs> the place is not the same, but the way people just kind of went, you yeah. know, to their areas of like their cliques, you know, yeah. and everybody kind of like you, you show up, you get That's your name wild. tag. And then I was, and then because of that, I could start to make associations. I'd be like, "Oh, that's so and so," because I could see they're hanging out with someone else, and then I yeah. and I'm picturing them standing next to each other. It was a that was a trip. Now, was anybody familiar with what you were doing? Was anybody following the show? I was nobody, nobody, nobody it, knew it. Not until I got out to the bars, which was funny. So at the reunion, which was actually really nice for me, like yeah. I <clears throat> I didn't want to go there and uh, talk about me and what I mean. People ask me what I'm doing for work, like. If you didn't know, I pretty much downplayed it. Mm -hmm. Just like, oh, I'm still in fitness because everyone knew I went into fitness. I've been in fitness since I was 20. Sure. So I'm just like, oh, I'm still into the fitness thing. And they're like, oh, you're still personal training. I'm like, well, kind of not really. I kind of like talk about personal training. I have this podcast thing that I do and a media thing. Like, so I just kind of downplayed most of it and uh, wanted to actually learn and talk to other people more than anything else. Later on, when we got to the bars, we went to the bars later on. People recognized me that were actually not in my class. That were other classes that were like fans and came up and. And then that's actually when it got kind of awkward and weird because then they were like, oh, my pup Adam. And then they were walking around because they yeah. knew who I was. Ooh, celebrity. Yeah, they started. Yeah. And then I got, I then I felt weird. Awkward. You know, yeah, it is awkward. It's awkward too when you're around people that have known you since you were a kid because then it feels like I'm like, I'm not trying to be like that cool guy yeah. at all like that. So yeah, that was a little bit weird. But speaking of the bars, so oh, this. Wait, any inappropriate hookups? <laughs> not that, that was I, always my favorite. Not what? that I, <laughs> watching people like not that I know of, but a lot of, there was there was a, there was a chick there that was there with her husband of like nine years, <clears throat> and she was one of the ones that got really wasted and sloppy, and you know she's like talking shit about him, and he's like 
50 feet away because she's like hella drunk. Oh, I've been Yikes. trying to get rid of him for years. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And she's like totally throwing herself at all, all the guys and stuff. I'm oh. like, yeah, yeah. So that was uh, that was a little weird. It's going to uh, be a long uh, car ride <laughs> home. Yeah, yeah, so that was kind of funny. But listen, so at the bar, there's this thing. I want to look up the, the company so I don't forget the name of it. I believe it's Touch. Oh, did I say Doug? Touch Tunes? Yeah, Touch Tunes. Okay. Have you guys seen these? What? No. You probably haven't because none of us are in the bar scene anymore. Rachel, have you seen Touch Tunes? Okay, so check this out. This is I'm, this is so brilliant that I haven't had a chance to do this yet, but I'm going to do it today as research and see if they are uh, publicly traded or not. So <clears throat> it's a jukebox, but it's like instead of, I mean, it's the new modern jukebox. It's this almost, I know I would say it's probably actually the exact size of our TV. So it's about that big. It's on the wall, and it's just like basically a, a virtual jukebox. Mm. You know, you can go over and you can swipe at it, and the the song that's playing is coming up. Nothing special. And it's playing the music like it was. But what's sick about it is it connects to an app, and so I download this app. And any bar that has these, what you do is, and they're smart because it's not doll. It's not. I bought tokens, which by the way, I have no idea how much I spent. I'll have to go back and look later on. But I bought like fifty four tokens, and then the, I can be in the bar anywhere. And I can change the jukebox through my from your phone. Yeah. Oh. Not even the brilliant part yet. Okay, that's cool, right? So it's that's again, it's just convenient. It's sure, nice, sure. simple. It's easy. The brilliant piece is I can pay four extra tokens to jump anybody else's song. Yeah. So let's say you're like like an asshole like me. Oh, it's gonna piss some people off. And you want to control the bar <laughs> all night long, and you don't give a fuck about spending an extra fifty or hundred bucks for the night. You come in, and I just like put all my lists and pay all the extra money. So I'm yeah. hopping everybody's song and I control the jukebox. Bro, that would be the funnest thing to do to oh, go into yeah. a bar and fuck with it. Bro. Yeah. Put on some death I went metal. Into, and I went into a country bar oh, yeah. and I started playing Travis Scott. I fucking switched it right up just to be that guy. <laughs> and and no one knows who's controlling it, but I'm paying extra money to have control of it. I was like, this is fucking brilliant. Yeah. Whoever thought of and then that? Then you have people battling. Why does Paul yeah. Abdul keep coming up? Yes, <laughs> yes. Isn't that it was isn't that great? I love that idea. I know. And I want to go to a bar boom. just to fuck with people. So yeah. everybody will even know. And and I think I just Rick Roll everybody. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. gonna give you up. Yeah. Let Every you song. Down. Yeah, just spend two hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. And, so and on, on a popular clears. night like that, when there's lots of people in there that are all trying to control it, you can kind of keep hopping their songs by doing that. And then it just, whoever doesn't pay extra to do that, it just... See, that makes me that makes me think that <laughs> it won't work out because I wonder if there's going to be a, a lot of assholes at every bar. And everyone's like, right. oh, this fucking song, oh, you know, and the bar, you know, the bar owner's going to be like, yeah, we're going to turn this shit Everybody show keeps clearing out. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, you know, because he's the one willing to spend the money. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know, but yeah, I thought I it know. was, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. So you control the music all night. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And we went, I mean, two, that's kind of we went to two bars, and they both had this thing there. So I, when we got to the next I bar, I haven't been to a bar. In some must forever. be doing well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't been out. Dude. I didn't even know this existed. It was obviously none of us are Lame. bar hopping today anymore. So, but so I, you stayed out late, dude, till three in the morning. What? Wow, like a champion. What are wow. you doing? Hung You're over. just like I don't sleep anyway, right? <laughs> yes, so. that's exactly. Yeah, yeah, it. It. yeah just, you got more sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hung over. Oh, did you do the charcoal? Oh, man. Oh, I didn't have. I, I, you, you didn't I can't drink without you. Yeah, you got to bring yeah. Sal. That was the the moral of mistake. This was I cannot go that hard without Sal anymore. Yeah. Like, cause I'm the brakes. You are. You're the, the gas. <laughs> yes. You got to have both for yeah. the car to go properly. And I didn't think I. W- I didn't. I didn't realize I was. I was telling I'm Katrina. The turn signal. I don't know. <laughs> no, <you're laughs> just, I don't know. No, you're the nitro. I just want to contribute. Yeah, you're the fucking yeah. nitrous. Oh, okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, don't add the Justin. Yeah. Yeah, no, you be careful. We're yeah, flying right? off yeah, the fucking. Yeah, yeah, it may so blow up. You and I together would be all bad, Justin. Yeah, we, it would. Yeah, we yeah, need Sal to. Ring make sure you guys stay alive. The angel would blow. Up. Not trying to be an e, e, you know, e Hollywood story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. A true Hollywood I, story. I had a really Absolutely. good time though. You know, it was. Uh, I didn't go to any of the other reunions. I think the five year, ten years, kind of like whatever. But it was cool because, and and this is why, because twenty years later, man, a lot of people have changed, and a lot of people have done some really cool things. Uh, and it was neat to, and I for sure linked back with some people that I'm like, oh shit, I'm gonna make sure that I stay in touch with him and stuff. Like he's doing some cool business moves that you know we might cross paths somehow one day. Like, so that was cool. Good and every you, and, and for the most part, everybody was really cool and chill. I thought it was a, it was a it was a nice, cool event. Nice. Justin, you have uh, you have any rat uh, updates for us? Yeah, well, I was I was actually reading more about like this problem in New York and this has been an ongoing thing that's like they're starting to put out more it's like 38% 
higher amounts of rats now that they're dealing with and they've tried so many different methods to get rid of them it's like creating this crazy business opportunity for like exterminators to come in and pitch ideas to the city and they give them like these million dollar contracts like a six million dollar contract for the year to like try and solve this problem so they've tried everything from like where like the main problem of when they get into the trash, people's trash. So they tried to, to basically like get the, the type of um, trash bags that are lined with some kind of mint. So that, that repel, it's like, they don't like to eat through it. Mm. So that kind of work didn't really work. I guess the latest one now is like this vat of like some kind of vinegar that, uh, that they're putting like these traps of like vinegar out and they're trying, they're just hoping that that will kind of, take hold and, and they'll be able to reduce the numbers, but the numbers are getting crazier and crazier and crazier. And it's like, I think it's like 4.4% across nationwide, like pest control has gone up like crazy. So there's this like mm. this sweeping rodent problem. Uh, that's a good thing. Wait, this is a good thing to note for investments. Well, yeah. This is good for Casey too. This, yeah. he's, that's oh, where, that's right. Yes. Like companies that's, he works with. Yeah. Right? No, yeah. Uh, that's the, that's what their number one client is pest control. Oh, people. Wow. Yeah. And, and I'm meanwhile, I'm trying to like solve this with a st stupid cat that just like hides all day. The cat doesn't do anything? No. <laughs> he hides in his little home and he's just scared. And I'm like, oh my God, oh, you're worthless. Are you, how are you going to make him get mean? I don't know. I don't know. I, might, like a, I might have to like- You got like an ADD Train cat. him or something. <laughs> 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 just walk by and just <laughs> rah! You know, like make sure he's like at alert or something. You know? I don't know. Yeah. Oh man, that sucks. Yeah. I, I was in the city all weekend uh, with my, co my cousin's- San just, Francisco? Yeah, he just got engaged to-, to, to lovely young lady great couple and so we were up there and two things one i probably walked i don't know 40,000 steps or 30,000 40,000 steps on the first day i'm not used to walking that much well, i don't realize how sedentary we are oh yeah dude that's bad, i don't dude. move after doing all that walking i was like sore i got fucking sore from walking <laughs> that's embarrassing that's really embarrassing you just admitted that right now. i know that's, super embarrassing i got sore bad. in my like my my like the muscles around my hips you know I, <laughs> I still think the most embarrassed i was when the wii came out with the wii sports and yeah. they had the boxing i was like sore for a whole week <laughs> from punching air yeah. <laughs> that was so Terrible. pathetic dude but anyway his his girlfriend is um she's an ultrasound technician and she does well she's a manager so she does ultrasounds and she'll look at people's kidneys or their livers or their ovaries or whatever and examine them. So she's like, you guys want a free ultrasound or whatever? So I'm like, hell yeah. Sure. So I go over there and she did the whole, she looked at everything on my inside. She even looked at my prostate. Now, don't get excited. Whoa, whoa. Don't get excited. Hey. You can actually do it from the stomach area. That's what she asked me. She said, do you want me to look at your prostate? My cousin's right there. I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Is he cool? I don't know. Yeah, you guys, what's going on? You got here? big enough gloves. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they, she looked Whoa. at everything, and uh, the words she used to describe my organs was beautiful. Just want to share that. That's one. what she said. Wow. She said, your or, your she said beautiful. Organs. This looks beautiful. Wow, this looks beautiful. <laughs> so you guys know how I'm a hypochondriac, right? Yeah. 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 Greatest day ever. Oh, <laughs> I oh. I, right away, I'm like, let's go get drunk. Like, my <laughs> liver's healthy. <laughs> Let's go get destroyed. Yeah, you know. Uh, anyway, it was it was it was a good time. So now I have the hookup for uh, for ultrasounds for myself. That's so cool. anytime that's, I feel that something. sounds like a party. Yeah, she looked at Jessica too. She's all good. She looks at mine. Oh my god. Yeah, what's going there's on? There's a war going on in there. <laughs> there's a lot of poop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's going on? Some backup. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway, I was also reading this paper on um, cannabinoids, and um, I'm going to read a, a little excerpt from it because I want to talk to you guys about this. I thought it was fascinating. This is something I've read about in the past. So with cannabinoids in the body, because your body makes its own cannabinoids, they call them endocannabinoids, and the way they work in the body, scientists have likened them to light uh, dimmers, uh, light dimmer switches. So it's like you go in a room, you turn a light on, and then there's that little dimmer switch that allows you to make the light brighter or darker. Well, scientists say that the cannabinoid system in the body works that way hmm. um, because they communicate retrograde. It's called retrograde signaling, and it's the principal mode by which endocannabinoids mediate the type of plasticity that synapses have. So what that means is the way that the synapses tend to communicate is things will go from presynapse to postsynapse. So dopamine will go from presynapse, postsynapse, you get your dopamine or whatever, you know, serotonin, whatever. Cannabinoids go retrograde. They go from postsynapse to presynapse, and what they're doing is they're communicating to the synapse 
if they need more or less of things. Mm. And so what they're doing is they're literally modeling, they're, they're improving the it's plasticity. The feedback system. So it regulates. It's a regulator. Yeah. It's totally a regulator. And this is why cannabinoids have such a wide-ranging uh, effects. This is why some people- it basically people, could help with almost anything when you think about it like that. Yeah, when you think about it that way, right? So like, like let's say like, you know, people who have pain or anxiety or PMS or migraines or inflammation, and they're like, well, how the hell can- supplementing with like hemp oil extract, you know, because that's got lots of cannabinoids. How the hell can that help all of those different things? Well, if you have an imbalance in the way that your body's communicating with itself, that can help regulate it. And there's something that is uh, that, that they're, they're trying to find, but they're, it's widely believed that this exists in humans, um, is known as endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. So either because of lifestyle or because of genetics, or both, some people start producing less and less of their own natural cannabinoids. And so the result of that being more pain, more anxiety, more inflammation, maybe even cancers and stuff like that. So supplementing with cannabinoids, phytocannabinoids that come from a plant, will help give your body more of kind of what it needs. And this is why some people have such amazing benefits from, from supplementing with cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other part of it is also why it's important to use a wide range of cannabinoids and not just focus on just one because they all seem to work a little differently and they all seem to work better. I've told you guys about the entourage effect. Right. Mm -hmm. So like uh, you know, our partner Ned, their uh, extract is full spectrum. So it's got all the cannabinoids. So you take that and then it helps – bring your body more towards its, its I balance. Wonder, I wonder how many people, because this is such a hard thing for the average person to measure, right? Like, how do you know if it's like you regulating can. well for you? Like, yeah. It, yeah, it's really hard to you measure. You can. It's basically going to be like, do you feel better? Yeah. You know, do you feel better from taking this particular thing? But at the end of the day, what I would recommend is figuring out why you feel normal when you supplement with phytocannabinoids and mm. figure that out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not like, oh, I found the cure. Now I've solved all my problems. Well, it's okay. Figure out why my this, body needs this. This endocannabinoid system, have they been able to kind of really pinpoint the sites where there's, you know, the most in yeah, the, the body? The, the gut is one of the number well, one, there's, right? Well, there, there's two receptors that they've identified, the CB1 receptor and the CB2 receptor. And one of them is most present in the nervous system in the brain. And the, the other one is, uh, is more prevalent in other parts of the body. But those two receptors, here's the crazy part. This is why it's so... Again, this is why there's so many wide-ranging effects. Those two receptors are among the most predominant uh, or plentiful what are called G-protein-coupled receptors in the body. G-protein-coupled receptors are receptors that pharmaceutical companies tend to target because they're on the outside of the cell. From what I understand, this is not my expertise, so if you're listening and you're a scientist and I'm fucking this up, please DM me. But, uh, but from what I understand, when something attaches to these receptors, they tell the cell they tell the cell to do something on the inside of the cell. So they tend to be targeted by pharmaceutical companies. Well, these cannabinoid receptors are among the most prevalent. They're everywhere throughout a whole body. So like you'll find certain receptors that are like, oh, these are mostly found in the eyes or these are mostly found in the liver yeah. or whatever. This, the cannabinoid receptors are found everywhere. And the mm. highest density being in the nervous system, the gut, uh, you know, like the stomach, they're they're found they're found in bone. There's a lot in bone. Well, this is why they can make mm. so many magical claims of it helping all these things, well, or, or why there's so many anecdotes. I would say, right? right? Why there's so many people that are like, oh no, it works for this, and the person's like, oh it, you know, like it works for the, like how can it relax you but also give you energy, or, or yeah. for some people, or how can it, you know, take away from pain but also help you with your your autoimmune issues? Like, and I used to think it was bull. I used to call so much bullshit. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, that's stupid. There's no way. It, it's what is it? Sounds it? Like, like magic. Yeah, was it snake oil or whatever? Right. But no, when you look at the fact that these cannabinoids or receptors are everywhere, that your body produces these these cannabinoids naturally, and that they they one of their main modes of operation is through retrograde signaling. Now it makes sense. It's everywhere in the body, and it's telling your body how to regulate itself. So if anything's off kilter. Then, uh, then it makes sense that cannabinoids can be part of the bringing things like into the balance. Built-in diagnostic system. Yeah, isn't that fucking weird? Pretty yeah. cool. Isn't that wild? It's very cool. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of uh, of cannabinoids, it reminded me of uh, Mexico's proposed new drug laws. Have you seen what they're talking about? No. Oh, they're gonna so, they're gonna open it up or what? Oh, wasn't it like is, uh, um, like opium was uh, 
like they're going to make it like somewhat like the, they weren't going to like uh, come down and arrest people if they had found it. Or? Well, so this is from Mexico's president. Hmm. So Mexico's president. I'm going to read this this uh, this first paragraph here. This was in Newsweek. Decriminalize. Mexico's president released a new plan last week that called for radical reform to the nation's drug laws, and they want to negotiate with the United States to take similar steps. Really? Whoa. Yes. Wow. Now, why why would they do that? Because if uh, Mexico well, has a, they already have a ton of drugs that are being sold over there. May as well get some tax money on it. That's well, why. well, would it really? Well, the big <laughs> lowers thing is, the power of the, the cartels. Y- Mexico has a terrible black market going on for drugs. <laughs> That's some, what I'm saying. There's some there's, cities are taking over. Yeah. There's so much going on. You may as well get you. You may as well tax it and get some of it. Well, here's the thing. If you want to, if you want to get rid of the drug car- cartels, you either can get more guns and, and kill them. Or allow the free market to out compete them. Out compete them. Yeah. In in which case now they're 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 battling with the market, which is a far more difficult uh, strategy. Also, um, the reason why they want America to to change our laws is because if we have strong prohibition laws, their drug market, their cartels will stay in business, just right. supplying yeah. America. Right. And so they're like, we need to. And I think this is a worldwide phenomenon. Mm-hmm. I mean, I made this prediction four years ago. I'm going to make it again. I think. The next ten to twenty years, we're going to see major drug reform in the in the way of decriminalization yeah. of many drugs because the drug war has just failed. But it's crazy that Mexico, because Mexico had the craziest drug laws for a while, they went the opposite direction for a second, where mm-hmm. they were militarizing their police. Yeah, they were like they were trying to only, fight fire with fire. Now the only reason why I well. don't think that'll happen is, don't you think? That people with as much power and money as like these cartels are not in the pockets of our pol- uh, 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 politicians. Like you got to think that. Oh, they'll go. They'll, they'll become legal. Is what they'll do. Uh, well, I think you got to. Th- you got to think that if you're you're a drug lord and you've got millions and millions of dollars and you've got so and so senator or whatever going in somewhere. Keep it that, illegal. Yeah, keep it. I want you to keep it illegal, yeah, yeah. right? If I'm a drug guy, yeah. and a lot of people don't think that way, they think it would be the opposite. Like if you're a drug person and you're creating all these drugs that you would want it to go legal so you could sell more drugs. No, it's not true at all. I want it to be illegal because it drives the price yeah. up. Well, by being what illegal. I think will happen is what yeah, happens tax free. What I think think will happen is what, <laughs> what right. happened to cannabis is that you had all the drug dealers and producers move to the legal side and try to make money the you know the, the legal the legit way because the reality is this with the drug guy with the drug cartels the way that they that they regulate their market is through violence because they don't have any other option yeah. if you're a drug dealer and someone steals your drugs you have no legal way of getting your money back or persecuting anyone. So the way you get your money back is through intimidation and violence, and that just escalates. If it becomes a market where it's decriminalized and they find ways to legalize it, uh, I think these drug cartels will try and become legal. I think that they'll take their money and try and invest and become legal, which... Well, ultimately, they'll have to. They'll have to. Yeah, no, no, ultimately, they'll have to. But what I'm wondering is I don't know if we can get it. I don't know if it'll be more tempting for... You know the guy or girl who has the vote or the mm-hmm. the say, and it, it ge- becoming something, and then getting paid off a million, two million dollars, or whatever the crazy number is for them to make sure that it doesn't go through. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's weird, and I think that there's a kind of a, a happy medium because, like, I, again, I was up in San Francisco this this weekend, and San Francisco's laws towards personal drug use, especially for the homeless, is like they leave them alone. So like nothing. Yeah, like if you're Meanwhile, shoot- if you uh, are in the NRA, apparently you're a Nazi. Right? Yeah, did you hear yeah. about that? Yeah. What? Yeah, they, they, that. They, yeah, San Francisco voted to declare the NRA a terrorist group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Me, but again, meanwhile, you could do heroin, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. and, and take a poop. And walk around naked. On the street, yeah, and <laughs> nobody will stop you. Yeah. So I think Totally a, consistent. Yeah, I think there's a medium. I think there's a happy medium. It's like, okay, drug use is decriminalized. You can't do it in public, though. Sorry. You know what I mean? You want to do, shoot a heroin? Go go to your house. Shoot. If you break any laws while you're on heroin, you're still going to jail. There's no excuse. You know that kind yeah. of stuff. But I think it'll be interesting. I think this is a whole total reversal on. We've now been in like what five decades of hardcore drug prohibition, mm-hmm. and it it's it it probably hasn't done anything. It hasn't worked. It's cost us I don't know how many trillions of dollars. Yeah, you know, cause a lot of problems. I don't know, man. It'd be interesting, yeah, to see how this plays out. Yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, our first question is from JJ JJD101717. What is the relationship between strength and endurance? Are they inversely related? Would it be possible to train both? Yeah, great question. Not inversely though. Somewhat. There's somewhat so here's They're why. Conflicting goals. They yeah. can be, and here's why. So think to yourself, 
what kind of uh, physical adaptations would occur to maximize strength versus the types of physical uh, adaptations that would need to occur for endurance and compare the two. So let's talk about strength for a second. For strength, you're going to want a central nervous system that fires uh, forcefully um, and completely. So it's the C CNS is like the electrical outlet. Like you plug it in, you get the juice. Boom. You want good, strong juice coming out. Quick and hard. Quick and hard from the CNS to give you lots of strength or just, just, just a good, solid signal. As far as the physical adaptations, bigger muscle fibers contract harder. So you're going to want bigger muscles. This is why training for strength produces bigger muscles than training for endurance. Mm -hmm. um, you don't need to worry so much about energy uh, efficiency because um, they're or, usually in bursts. Well, oh, yeah, you, you're not. You're Short not. Burst. Yeah, you're not. You doing strength for long, long periods of time. Although you are improving your energy efficiency when it comes to the short bursts, your body will learn to produce the fast types of energy faster, uh, like uh, ATP. Right? Mm -hmm. ATP is that explosive energy. So your body will become more efficient at producing that. Um, you may. Your body may be able to store more ATP as you train for strength. That also means your muscle fibers get bigger. So overall, bigger muscles, louder central nervous system um, signal. Those are the adaptations. Now let's go to endurance. For endurance, you need a muscle that can contract, not very forcefully, but one that can contract for long periods of time. You you need energy efficiency in the term of uh, in terms of the type of energy that you're going to be using for that type of contraction, which is glycogen um, and fatty acids. A big muscle, not a good thing. A big muscle, just like an engine for a car, a bigger engine will produce more power, but will also use up more energy and gas. So for endurance, you want smaller muscles. Yeah, you want to be economical. Yeah, you want smaller muscles that are energy efficient, that can contract, not forcefully, but consistently over long periods of time. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that these both don't also contribute to each other. Sure. You absolutely. can train just for endurance and actually get some strength. Mm -hmm. And you could train just for strength and get some endurance. So it's not, that's what I meant by, I don't think uh, inversely related is-, is, is If you push- there's carryover If you still. push them to the extremes, they are though, right? Yeah. Like right? If I'm pushing strength to the absolute max extreme, then if I train for endurance, I'll probably take away some strength. Right. And vice versa. So that's where they become- And so here's the thing with the body, the body has to make a compromise. Mm -hmm. So if you're asking your body for all these different types of adaptations, and the way you ask your body is through your workouts, right? Through your workouts on lifestyle and diet, you're sending the signal, this is what I want. I want more strength. I want more endurance. I want more whatever. When you're sending your body all these different signals, your body has to make a compromise. I need a car that is both explosive off, off the line, zero to 60, but I also need a car that can travel for- a thousand miles without having to get a new tank of gas. What right. you're going to get is something in the middle. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? This is why <clears throat> hybrid when, training. when I recommend how to train this way, I, I, I typically want to nail down the person to give me one of them a little bit more important than the other. So I want to get that from them. Like if you said to yeah. me like, oh, I want both. Okay, that's okay. We can agree that we want both. But is there one that's a little more important than the other for you? Yeah. And then we're going to prioritize your programming that way. Totally. So, and I, the, the split's going to look something like this, where 60% of your training is focused on one, at least 60 to 70% is focused on one, and then the other 30%. So if we were to look at it like days, it would be three days, if I cared about strength more than anything else, three days a week, I am training strength focus, and then maybe one or two days a week, I'm incorporating some sort of endurance training in there. Yeah, and this is too, like when I start looking into different sports that I have to really understand the athlete and what their desired outcome is in terms of like what attribute they're trying to build up more, like for like a soccer player, a rugby player, something like that, where it's sort of a hybrid of both, mainly like a rugby player, right? Because you have to be explosive, but also you're constantly running and, and being like efficient with your energy. So, you know, what position do you play? Right. Like, are you all, like all on the outside where you're just running constantly and, uh, you know, you, you need to really focus a little more on the endurance end of it. Are you really explosive and, you know, the go-to guy out of a scrum to, to go right up and try and score? And like, so just as a coach uh, to get a little more insight on uh, those specific things, you can train for both. It's just going to take away uh, a little bit from both ends of that spectrum. Right? Uh, absolutely. So can, consider that for yourself. Which one do you want more? Do you want to be extreme in one or the other? And then here's the final thing. They can both be, 
a detriment to the other in the sense that if your strength is so bad, let's say you have terrible strength, you're very, very weak, your endurance will suffer also. So even if you're looking for maximum endurance, you have to have a certain baseline of strength in order to perform that endurance. And if your endurance is so terrible that you can't even perform your fi- your feats of strength, then the, then the endurance, the lack of endurance is taken away from your strength. So that's the other thing to consider. So I know, I know for me as a lifter, somebody who's always interested in lifting weights and building muscle and getting strong, I remember years ago, my cardiovascular endurance was so bad that I would get on a stationary bike and in 10 minutes I would be breathing hard. So I started training my endurance a little bit and I got stronger as a result. But it was because my endurance was so bad that it was holding me back. This is why I run my occasional mile. Just to kind of get a pulse on that. Mm -hmm. I'll run a a mile and see how tough a mile is for me at whatever pace on the treadmill. And if it's something that I haven't done in months and I'm suffering from it, Mm -hmm. I'll kind of pick it up where I'm doing it one time a week or so, which is what I'm doing right now. Because I just recently did that and I was gassed when I was doing it. I was like, oh shit, okay. This is probably even affecting my weight training. I'd probably be getting better lifts Mm -hmm. if I had a little bit more endurance. So all I do is now... You know, once a week, I'll start my workout with, after I do my mobility work, I go right over to the treadmill, I do my mile, I try and push my intensity on it, see if I can improve on my time, and then I go into my training program. And so that kind of keeps that at that level to your point, So, Next question is from R. Hanks one What are your go-to exercises for working the serratus? Oh, yeah. One of the most neglected uh, muscles, I guess, of the upper body in terms of training and strengthening. You know, it's funny. In the 70s, Arnold popularized serratus training quite a bit. He mm. talks about a time, one of the one of the very few contests he lost as a bodybuilder, he lost uh, one contest, I don't remember which one it was, if it was a Mr. Universe, to Frank Zane. And Frank Zane, for those p- people who don't know who he is, was this bodybuilder who was much smaller. So Arnold was the mass monster of his day. He was just a big, beefy bodybuilder, big arms, big chest, big back. And Zane was this much smaller, probably sixty pound lighter. Zane, yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> right, so. dad jokes are getting great. <laughs> yeah. He was chiseled and lean. And one thing that Zane had over over Arnold and why Arnold lost was Zane had this amazing chiseled body and this incredible serratus muscle. The serratus muscle almost looks like abs that come up the sides of your body. Yeah. Like uh, gills. Um, I think I call them their gills. Yeah, up, up underneath <laughs> yeah. The, the armpit area, yeah, right? I could see that, yeah. And Arnold looked and broke that down and was like, I'll never lose like that, you know, because of that again, and started doing all these serratus exercises. In fact, if you go to, if you're, if you have his uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, one of my favorite old school bodybuilding books, he, he writes about exercises specifically for the serratus. I don't remember like, what he recommends in there. What does he recommend? He does a, he does a cable uh, he does this, pullover right? crunch. Yeah, which. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of hits the serratus, but it's not really a, a direct I'm exercise. A, I'm a side plank guy with this, dude, because I can take a side plank and get other benefits out of it too, like posture wise. Yeah. Like, I think I could take somebody on a side plank and get some of those benefits. Plus, too, when we're talking about a muscle that's really, really small like that, that most people aren't even lean enough to yeah. see it, Yeah, it's kind of tough to put a, a well, lot of energy. Here's why I've never tried to isolate it. Well, here's um, why it's important. I have. I, when I was yeah. competing, I was. That's well, all, yeah, I'll tell you that's why. Yeah. Honestly, that's the only time that I though Because you want it to look good. Yeah, there, and, yeah. and I also know that I'm going to get down to 3%, and it's going to be really yeah. shown. Otherwise, it's one of those muscles that you could probably directly train it all day long and not even tell a difference. No, again. but now here's what's important about it. It's extremely important for shoulder stability because it attacks. Mm to the scapula, the shoulder blade, and it stabilizes it. And here's how you know when someone has a serratus problem. You watch them do a push-up, and their shoulder blades wing out. You ever seen that? Yeah. yeah. Where they get that, the shoulder blade sticks out and it yeah. wings anytime yeah. they push against something. That's because their serratus is not stabilizing their shoulder this blade. This is why I think the side plank is so beautiful for it. Side plank can help. I like uh, the dead stop push-ups where your arms stay, your, your arms stay straight out. And what you're doing is you're letting the oh, shoulder blades come like back. Oh, it's a scapular push-up. Yes, yeah. a yeah. scapular push-up. Thank you. That's the name I was looking for. Yeah. That's I, a yeah, great I've exercise. Yeah, I've done those. Yeah, I le- those, that's good to train just, you know, overall, like getting con- better connected to your uh, scapula. That's hard for some people to yeah. do. Yeah. It is. And yeah. you can do them up against the wall to start, right? So start up against the wall and practice that that scapular spread that kind of works the serratus. You know what, Doug, you should make a note so Danny does that because that's I don't I know we've never taught that on the uh, YouTube now, channel. Now, here's a point. Here's an important point around this. Joe DeFranco did this post about this. This is one of the things I love about Joe is you could tell he's trained a lot of people because he the, just the way he communicates things. And he's like, you know, as lifters, we're always focused on uh, bringing the shoulder blades back, scapular retraction, scapular retraction, scapular retraction. We never strengthen 
scapular protraction. Right. And part of the reason why we don't do that is people are walking around with protracted shoulder, you know, shoulder blades all the time. Yeah, we're trying to correct that issue. But we're not working the muscles that protract the shoulders, which can cause an imbalance. Mm -hmm. And so he talks about those scapular push-ups. Plus, being most of the real functional lifts are with, in that rounded position where you're hugging something in front of you. So, so Absolutely. To that point, this is where uh, I remember when I changed the way I did a seated row. So for many years, I taught a seated row with clients because because so many people are in a very protracted forward shoulder position to sit upright and stay retracted the entire movement and never let the shoulders. Yeah. But you want to feel your serratus actually roll the I shoulders, the same, yeah. roll the shoulders and flare the lats and control it from there and then pull them all the way back and go into seated yeah. row. And you will feel that big time in there. Now, a great yeah. way to connect to your serratus because a lot of people have no idea what that muscle does or what it feels like. Practice a uh, a front lat spread. This is a bodybuilding uh, pose in bodybuilding. Bodybuilding, there's, there's specific poses that you have to do. The front lat spread for the listeners who don't know what I'm talking about. It's the one where the bodybuilders sexy though. They have their hands on their waist, yeah, and they bring their they they bring their chest up and their lats their wings come out. If you can practice that pose and connect to your scapula, your shoulder blades to spread them out, what you're activating. Is your serratus. And if you include that in the seated row move, which yeah. is what I'm talking about, yep. you will work it. You'll work it and you'll feel it, which is kind of what I do. Like that's how I train seated row now, mm -hmm. is I just make sure to incorporate it there. I wouldn't really target yeah, that's it. That's full range of motion. You yeah. Get, and you're yeah. gonna it's gonna get strong and and and, and definitely would be defined if I were to lean yeah. out, you would see it. A lot of people's shoulder problems have are not due to the 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 shoulder joint, the individual shoulder joint itself or the humerus, the arm goes into the socket. A lot of people's shoulder joint uh, shoulder problems come from the other aspects of the shoulder joint, like the scapula, mm -hmm. the shoulder blade. And if your shoulder blade isn't, you know, I, I love doing this to, to, to clients. It's hard to explain over the podcast, but I would have a client come in and I'd, I'd have them roll their shoulders as hard as they could. So they were kind of spreading their scapula. And then I'd say, now let's keep your shoulders rolled as far as you possibly can. Now let's see how straight you can get your arm up yeah, above your head. It stops. Yeah. And you can't. Yeah. It stops right there because any further, I need to be able to bring my shoulder blade back. Mm -hmm. And it was my way of communicating to them how important it was to, to get that shoulder position. Yeah, to get that mobility and the strength in the shoulder blade. So I definitely think for those of you listening who've been working out for a long time, I think it's a good idea. You don't have to do go crazy, but do some of these uh, these these you scapular have, push ups. You should have control of it. Yes. That yeah. the, the 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 takeaway is that you should have control of that muscle. It's a very mm -hmm. important muscle, mm -hmm. and if you don't know how to train it, you've never felt it before. You can't control like a lat spread like that. It's an it's an exercise worth doing for that exact reason, and then you can find creative ways to actually incorporate it in yep. other movements. Yep, and you can get. I mean, if your pull ups hurt. If you do pull-ups and your shoulder hurts, if you do bench presses and your shoulder mm -hmm. hurts, or push-ups or overhead presses and your shoulder hurts, a lot of times it has to do with the scapula. A lot of times it has to do with that muscle right there. Next question is from Mike DeTore. Is drinking naturally flavored seltzer water or sparkling water any better than drinking diet soda? I hope so. That's what I do. You've been pounding yeah. those like crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I know. Me nope. too. Yeah. Fuck. Those, the, the, La Croix, the La Croix. Well, yeah, most La Croix. of them say naturally flavored, and it's not even like there's no sweetener in there. So, yeah. I mean, you're just getting like seltzer water with just like yeah. a pretend amount of flavor. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, it's like water that was like, dreaming about berries. Yeah. Like a fairy farted yeah, yeah. on it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it yeah. became what it this, is. This water was transported in a truck full of strawberries, you know, but that's, there's no drink. <laughs> I mean, I would- By I, osmosis. I yeah. mean, I would say it's a lot better, right? I mean, I think uh, uh, drinking LaCroix is a much better uh, alternative than Diet Coke. It, it's flavored with um, some of the natural oils that come from these compounds. So if you drink, if you ever drink one of these, it's like- it gives you the aftertaste of what you want. It's yeah. not really flavored. You know what it I mean? It reminds me now, have you ever gone to like uh, one of those, like a Marriott or whatever in the beginning, like as you walk in, they have these, these, uh, these vats of water with like, you have mint or whatever in the water and it just infuses like that flavor. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's just there. It's inside it, but it's not like, it just kind of absorbs. Some it's, of it's exactly like it. that. Yeah. So here's, I'll give you the pluses and I'll give you the minuses. Now here's the plus. The plus is, it's basically water. It's very, very minimal anything else, if anything. So um, it's far better. In and my carbonation. Opinion. Yeah, it's far better, than, in my opinion, than, than an artificially sweetened uh, beverage. Here's the minus. The minus is that you're still trying to make water more palatable. Okay. Now, why is that a, mi a minus? Well, if it gets you to drink more water, I guess it's a plus. 
If it gets you to only drink that and you don't like to drink water, then it becomes a minus. And I've had clients like this. Well, it could also be, I mean, it, it could be a plug because the way I'm using it is not because I- Maybe it's a stepping stone towards it. I'm, right? not, I'm not drinking it to get myself to drink more water. I'm drinking it so I don't drink Diet Coke. Sure, it depends how you use it, right? Right. right. So yeah. for me, because I still drink my big old thing of water on a regular basis, mm -hmm. what I use it for is like, you know, it tends to be around dinner time for me and, and I want like a soda yeah. with that dinner. And when I have that feeling where I want a soda, I just, we keep LaCroix in there and I'll go over and have that. Mm -hmm. And it, it's something to do with the mouthfeel of the carbonation and a little bit of flavor. Mm -hmm. That is, it's not very sweet, but it's a little bit of sweet and it's got carbonation flavor. It kind of tricks me into feeling like I'm kind of getting that, that sweet feeling that I would get from a Diet Coke. And I know it's a much healthier alternative. Have you guys ever trained clients that will say things like, oh, I don't like the taste of water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's weird. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. But that happens. It's like some dummy saying like, you don't like the taste of air. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like, not supposed to taste. Air, air doesn't taste like anything. <laughs> Can you, yeah, yeah. Why, why isn't there like scented Except candles? Vegas. Everywhere? Yeah. Give you the <laughs> well, cotton candy. Well, air. that's why I'm, that's why I, I, why I could see one of the negatives is that if you get into this, this pattern of just, I need to have something my water has to taste like something all the time. Yeah, you're re you're strength you're conditioned. It. Yeah, you're creating a bad pattern, a, re a behavior pattern with what you drink. And then, yeah, water does taste bland because you've conditioned yourself to think that water tastes bland. In which case, I would say stay away from it. But other than that, no, I, I wouldn't put it in the same because diet soda far more palatable. Diet soda is sweet. Uh, the, and way more shit in it. Yeah, like the flavored waters that we're talking about right now. They're not sweet. No, it doesn't hit the sweet. No, sensation. it doesn't give you that kind of satisfaction. No, no, no. And so, <laughs> and so, I don't know if it's going to make you want to eat more. Like, I think di I know diet soda definitely makes you want to eat more. No, definitely. But I don't think those waters do. No, I don't think so. Next question is from Hanha. What's the importance of having hobbies that aren't fitness or health related, and where to start if you don't have any? You know what's cool? Uh, this question reminded me of something that uh, my sister Cassie and her husband Tom do, and I think it's really cool. They've been together for umpteen years now. They've been together. 12. Yeah, 12 years. Yeah. Yeah, just their, <laughs> I've, been, I've been paying attention. You saw Wait, that. Wait, hold on a What? I'm just saying. I, <laughs> He's all umpteen. I follow her on Instagram. It's not yeah, yeah. 12. Yeah, 12 years. <laughs> it's a long time, bro. Yeah. So 12 years they've been together. And my sister and him, they do this every, I think they do it like every three to five years now because they've done it a, a few times where uh, they decide, it's just a fun way for them to spice up their relationship and, and make sure they keep their independence and, and doing new things, is they pick up a new hobby. Uh, that it, Sometimes it kind of is fitness and health, but that doesn't need to be that way. It's like, it's more designed like this. They And the way they decide this is they don't go like, oh, let's try this hobby, or I think this, they actually start making a list of things that they enjoy and they like. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, oh, I like outdoors things, or oh, I like tech stuff. Oh, I like uh, things that are challenging and that is going to make me have to get better and better mm -hmm. at it. Oh, I like things that have gadgets that go with it. Like, they start compiling these lists and they each do their own individual one because this is not a hobby they do together. It's a separate thing for them individually. And they and that's how my sister actually got into paddle boarding, which she's heavy into right now. And that's actually how Tom got into downhill mountain biking. You know, he was like, his thing is like, I like something risky, you know, and challenging. I want it to be kind of physical and outdoors and Cassie, you know, so they cool. had some things that were similar and some things that were different. And that's how they came about that. And then they just started searching online of hobbies that lined up with all these things. Mm -hmm. And they, that's how they came out with this hobby. And I think it's... That's a great practice. No, I think it's really... And I don't think you need to go... Like, I know the question says, is importance of having hobbies that aren't fitness and health related. I don't, I don't think, think it makes a difference. Yeah, right? I don't think it's so important that it has to be you like, oh, I, I do so much health and fitness stuff. I should do something that's non Mm. Uh, non-fitness. I think I wouldn't do that. I mean, maybe maybe you're a person who really likes doing physical type things. Well, that's what I was going to say. I think the some of the value of the hobby is that you enjoy doing it because you enjoy doing it. I think sometimes people will choose hobbies that are health related, not because they like the hobby of it, but because they like the benefit. So it's like, I want to mm. lose weight, so I'm going to get more hobbies that make me more active. When you ask them, you know, would you do these things if they didn't make you lose weight? They'd say, no, mm -hmm. no, I wouldn't. No. I do think it's important to have hobbies that you do just because for the sake of doing them. Now, if that is working out, then that's great. Now, I, could, I can honestly tell you that if I could keep all my muscle and never lose a pound of muscle ever again, I'd still lift weights. I love the act of lifting weights. I love the feel of it. I love the, the workout itself. So it's a hobby I would continue doing even if my body could maintain itself without doing any any workouts, you know? Yeah, I just need something different for my own sanity. 
So I I like to explore for me especially music and uh, at one point Courtney and I both uh, took lessons together, which I thought was you know it was great. It was a great experience because you know it was challenging for her because her mind doesn't really tend to go in that direction. It's very like analytical and you know was used to being in a clinical setting and like everything had to be just so into experiment and have to kind of learn an entire new skill was you know it was great to talk about, create a great dialogue between us. Uh, and you know for me too, like. I've I've been looking for new things as well. She started rock climbing. You know, I started to kind of get back into uh, playing music and getting into collecting vinyl and things and trying to get my music mm-hmm. brain like fired up again. And so it's I just find it like it's it's deeper, it's richer. There's more to life than uh, just being like neurotic about some of the same old things all the time. Like just experience more things. It's just a healthy thing. Well, to that point, and I think this is this is something that I experienced not that long ago. Um, and I guess so. Maybe here's where there's some benefits of of it not being fitness related or trying to find something aside just from fitness stuff. Is because at one point in your life you may have something that doesn't allow you to do something physically. Like when I tore my Achilles, it was kind of mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. you know, the weightlifting, basketball, yeah. all the athletic things that I love to do. And I, I remember kind of going through this little bit of depression. And I remember what kind of got me out of it was reaching to the things that I had a lot of passion for, like when I was younger. And music was one of those, just listening to music. Like mm-hmm. I love music in all different genres. And that was what really kicked back up the the Spotify list and listening to more music. I was doing a lot of audio books at the time. Uh, and I had kind of lost, uh, listening to music kind of fell out of favor for me. And so I tried to rekindle something like that. Mm-hmm. So I do think that there is some value for that because if you are, if you identify with being the fit person and everything you do is super physical and active and all about health, it, you know, there might be something that happens to you in your life at one point where but eventually that'll happen. I mean, right. eventually you're not going to be able to be super active. Right. And so if you, if everything revolves around that and you don't have something yeah. that doesn't require you to be really active, that you don't also enjoy that could cause depression or make you just an irritable person to mm-hmm. be around because now you physically can't do it, which is what happened to me. I saw myself getting very irritated because I couldn't, yeah. you know, and I don't do well with that because I do like to be physical. I do like to do active things. So you know, having some hobbies that don't require the the physical activity that also stimulate your mind or stimulate you emotionally somehow that you enjoy. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value. I also there. like it because to, nowadays we're we're so busy, um, but we're not very active, obviously. But we're very busy, and we're busy with a lot of things that we we don't necessarily need to be busy doing. Like if you look at like the amount of time kids uh, and even adults will spend on like social media, Mm -hmm. you know, if you take that time out, that's hours of the week that could be dedicated to a hobby that will probably give you a lot more value than the distracting waste of time that tends to happen on social media. Especially when you start to make the connection like you've already made with weight training, which is the the meditative side of things, Mm -hmm. right? Like there's some, some serious value in doing something like, I it's so funny uh, talking about this. I've never done like the the model planes or the ship in the bottle thing. Yeah. And f- just recently, I thought maybe I'll do, maybe I'll try that. Cool. And the, you know what makes You're me becoming want- such a dad? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly what it. What what makes me want to do that is actually oh, just the yeah. peace of nobody being around, having to be so focused on something that's so detailed that actually I'm attracted to that right now. Yes. Like I, that thought of that of. No distractions, quiet, focusing on something, just completely like being. This is why you have grown men. Dude, I got into wood carving for a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same reason. This is yeah. why you have grown men with like train sets. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, when yeah, I was yeah. a kid, I'm like, so dumb. Why would you have a train set? You're a grown man. Now I'm like, that would be fucking I'm like, cool. That's cool. I'm like peaceful. <laughs> yeah, you just so, spend hours <laughs> making I trains. I can just watch it go so, around in circles. You guys know that I've been like house shopping and looking at properties for quite some time now. And there's a, one of the places I was looking at this guy has got a, a full train that runs through his whole house. I was like almost sold just from that. Oh my God. <laughs> Katrina's like, we're not going to have a train that runs through all- Really? Come on, that wouldn't Dude, be Mr. So- Rogers did. It's through, like he has it going through the walls, upstairs, downstairs. What? Yes, it's dope. Wow. It's a wood, I'll show you this house. It's a wood train. Uh, you should, I think you should buy it. I know. That's so awesome. <laughs> That's so, I was, just I was, for that. I was talking with Jessica this weekend and I was, and we were talking about our, li- our living room or whatever and I'm like, I think I want a fucking recliner. I think it's time to get a recliner, you know? Yeah. It's like all this stuff that starts to happen as you become a dad and you get older, you start yeah. to like realize the value of <laughs> yeah. like oh, think yeah. about watching TV in a recliner. Ah, oh, just sit back and 
Yeah. Watch 20 minutes and fall asleep. Yeah. You know what I'm like, saying? Why am I giving you kids the remote? Yeah. You, you shouldn't ever have the remote. I never got it. And, and with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find us on Instagram. You can find me at mindpumpsal, Justin at mindpumpjustin, and Adam at mindpumpadam.